This presentation has three parts, or acts, if you will. The first is, number one, beginnings. It is named that simply because it is the beginning, but also because it is about land acknowledgement, and uh, that concerns about 99% of U.S. history that is deliberately not taught as part of this nation's story. The second act is, number two, the forgotten trunk in the attic the Native experience, which is about untruth, uh, or what I consider to be the scam of the great identity theft. And the final act is drilling down, being Cherokee, and an overview of the Cherokee Nation, which is arguably the most storied tribe in our nation's pantheon. Number one, beginnings. Oseo, Dakwadoa, Galen, Gritz, Chalich, Si, Satelawai, Dagegai, St. Louis, Wado. Hello, my name is Galen Gritz. I am a Cherokee from St. Louis. Thanks. Thanks for coming and visiting with me tonight and giving me this opportunity. My shirt says OCO, which means hello. And that's exactly how it's pronounced O C O. Uh, originally, the Cherokees did not have last names, they were known by their family group or clan. Uh, to which their mothers or grandmothers belonged. And they were a matrilineal uh, society. The Cherokees today have seven clans. They are the wolf, the long hair, blue, wild potato, deer, bird, and paint. At one time, there was an eighth clan, the bear clan. But bear did not like being human, so he went back to being an animal. My grandmother's clan is the Wolf Clan, so that's what I am. The Wolf Clan members are known as protectors. Europeans who encountered the Cherokees very early on were shocked to learn that Cherokee women were equal with men and had true economic and political power. Carolyn Johnston, professor and author of the Cherokee Women in Crisis, writes about a great historical example. In February of 1757, the great Cherokee leader, Atacula Kula, came to South Carolina to negotiate trade agreements with the governor of that colony, and were shocked to find that there were no women were present for that council. Since the white man, as well as the red man, was born of women, did not the white men admit women to their council? <laughs> is what he asked the governor of South Carolina. The governor was so taken aback by the question that he took several days to come up with this weak and untrue response. The white men do place confidence in their women and share their counsels with them when they know their hearts are good, which was to say never. <laughs> Remind me of how many women signed the Declaration of Independence or how many were delegates to the Constitutional Convention. In the Cherokee Nation, at least before contact and in the beginning of contact with the white society, women had a lot of power and sometimes could be cheap. I am asked often what the proper form of address is for Native people. Is it American Indian or Native Americans? Of course, in Canada, they refer to their Native people as first people. Uh, First tribes. Um, I use both ball terms interchangeably, and you'll hear that throughout my talk tonight, although I do prefer Native American, but it doesn't bother me to use the term Indian or American Indians. However, if you're referring to a particular tribal member, for instance myself, and you're talking to somebody about me, you would say Galen Gritz, uh, a member of the Cherokee Nation and the first time that you mentioned me. Or if you were doing it in writing, you would put parentheses around that. You would write, well, last night, Galen Gritz, parentheses, Cherokee, blah, blah, blah. And then you would mention me again, you wouldn't have to do that. So it's just a way of identifying you by your tribe rather than a Native American or Indians. Um, the dominant cultures Four cardinal directions, and I get confused because I'm not from here, but I think that's north, is that right? No, no, that's south. That's that way, 
okay? <laughs> North, east, south, and west, east, south, and west, are very good for mapping property lines, defining ownership, tracking capital and investments, and encouraging the extraction of resources. Think of a grid or a spreadsheet. My people, the Cherokee, have seven cardinal directions. Besides east, west, south, and north, we also have up, down, and here. And any time that you walk a trail or out in the woods, if you're looking at the path for stones or roots to avoid tripping over, you're not seeing the birds and the trees above you. And where you were five minutes ago is not where you are now. So the seven cardinal directions are a much more powerful and useful way to experience the world. It is relational and not extractive. And the Cherokee seven cardinal directions helps me to realize much to my surprise and to my chagrin that I am now an elder. That's because of the de designation of here. I can easily see myself as being 17 or 26 years old. Just ask my wife. But that's not what you see when you consider me for the first time. At age 70, most of my walk is behind me. In all my life, I've been looking for justice and looking for a truth that leads to that justice. A man found an inebriated person leaning against a lamppost on a dark street. The tipsy person seemed to be looking for something on the ground. The first person asked, did you lose something? The drunk person said, I seem to have dropped my wallet. And the first person said, I can help you look. And he said, that's okay, I dropped it down the street where it's dark. The light is way better here by the lamppost. <laughs> Sometimes that's what looking for justice feels like. Looking for love in all the wrong places. Land acknowledgement is the understanding of how we came to live where we do. It acknowledges the reality of ownership. It honors the places indigenous people, past and present, and recognize the history that brought us to where we are today. That is why it's so important. It recognizes the history that most of us have been forbidden to know. Uh, it begins to celebrate people we may only know as caricatures. Land acknowledgement recognizes how we have inadvertently benefited from the history of colonization, removal, and sometimes genocide of indigenous people. It is a starting point. It should not be the only way we recognize and support indigenous people. Native Americans never willingly ceded their ownership of the land in the US uh, to the US or to the Europeans. Uh, none of the treaties ever made for Native Americans removal, there was about 370 of them, were ever kept in their complete um, wording by the U.S. government, none of them. So like the Ukrainians, we were faced by unwanted invaders intent on taking our land. We did not keep them out. You could say that the mission of the United States from 1776 until 1912, when Arizona became the 48th state to join the Union, was to take the land from the Indians. The fabled Gateway Arch in downtown St. Louis is a national monument to the invaders' successful military operation against us. To us, it seems to be a national tombstone. And I would like to recognize the Wasage or the Osage in the Oto, Missouri, tribes whose land we now occupy. The state is named after the Missouri. Uh, they are both now in Oklahoma. There are both two of the 39 tribes down there. And the Missouri became so small that they kind of merged with the Oto. The Osage were the predominant tribe in what is now Missouri by the time the Spanish, French, and the Americans arrived. I was at Pahuska, Oklahoma two months ago uh, at their tribal museum and their tribal headquarters. In addition, other time, tribes were also in Missouri in historical time, and those were the Sock and Fox, the Iowa, the Call, the Illini, the Kickapoo, the Peoria, Shawnee, Delaware, Sioux, and Piankasha. Some were in part of the states where the Osage were here. I mean, there was no state line, so they might come across 
the river for a month or two and hang out. They might come down from Iowa pursuing some game and then go back. But others were coming from the east as more and more pressure from the whites for their land. Uh, they were trying to escape where they were forced out and so they came into Missouri. The Osage weren't real happy about it, but that's the way it was. And I am mindful that all these people continue a sacred relationship with the land we now occupy. It's important to note that Native Americans' identity came through their place. Um, and it's when you move them, that really just disrupts their idea of who they are. And I recognize and appreciate the integral contributions to the culture, cultural heritage of this state and to our nation's history. Now just think about it, we have kept some of the native place names, even though the natives are gone. Mississippi, the Missouri, the Gascone, the Osage, up east it's Potomac and the Merrimack River up in uh, Connecticut, Rhode Island, uh, Massachusetts. These are all Native American names and thank goodness we have them. Because if it was left to the dominant culture, it would be Glen Field, Forest Field, Glen Forest, Forest Glen, Glen Road, Forest Road. We don't seem to be very imaginative when it comes to naming places. So thank goodness we have some of the native names to, to use. Archaeology tells us that native societies have existed in now what is the state of Missouri for 12,000 to 14,000 years. Now think about that. There is plenty of evidence of them being here. Farmers will recognize this when they plow their fields or when people do construction. They will knock up all kinds of artifacts because when you have people living in the land, they're going to be all over that land for that many years. And you can't go anywhere in this state and not come across artifacts if you know how to look for them. And we did live in relationship with the land. We did not see it as a commodity to be exploited. And the land was not harmed when we were stewards of it. After DeSoto arrived, uh, he came up to DeSoto, Missouri. That's the furthest he came, the Spanish explorer. From that time on, 85% um, of the state's wetlands disappeared. So if you ever wonder what it was like before the whites were here for the Indians, it's hard to imagine because the fauna, the flora, the physicality of the land has changed so much. It's almost as if we live on the moon today and those people prior to first contact lived on the earth. It's physically that much different because of levees and dams and engineering. It used to be things would flood and then go back in, there'd be swamps. And the number one way that the native people got their protein was through fishing, and then through fowl, and then through hunting. I always thought it was like, uh, you go out and shoot a deer. Well, certainly there were deer, but there were a lot more fish and, and easy deer catch and uh, waterfowl uh, at one time. So I want to thank you for your concern for the home that we now share. Number two, the forgotten trunk in the attic, the native experience. Today, photos and movies are the main way uh, that we, as a culture, remember things, and maybe as individuals. Let's see if that's true. How many of you have heard of YouTube, Instagram, or Netflix? How many of you looked at a TV, computer, our phone in the last day. Of course, the numbers go up dramatically when I'm talking to fifth graders. <laughs> How many of you read Time Magazine or the New York Times today? So people really, really do remember things by looking at them. Once the entire village shared stories around fires, that's how we communicate. And now, as individuals, we stare at our own screens, earnestly searching for some kind of meaning. It's like reading tea leaves, or like the Romans did from reading the animal entrails. Today, generally, we are trapped in echo chambers where we hear only our own voice or those that we choose to hear. It's rare that we listen to people outside of what we feel comfortable with. So, we are in essence singing songs and they carrying signs, mostly saying, hooray for our side. From that old Buffalo Springfield song. 
So what happened to <coughs> Native folks generally was not recorded on cameras. Cameras came a long way too late for our story. So our story has been largely dismissed, partly because of that, partly because of other reasons. So an effort must be made to tell it. Native people learn quickly. We hold these truths to be self-evident that Native American history will be excluded from the American story and that instead omissions, lies, and untruths will be made instead. The list in the Declaration of Independence, the very last thing that is said, there's 27 lists that the colonists were mad or pissed off about with King George of England. And the very last one, the very last thing in the Declaration of Independence, which most of us don't sit around reading nowadays for entertainment. But if you were to read it, you would find out that it says, he has excited domestic insurrections among us and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages, whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished, undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and condition. And that is the only time that American Indians are mentioned in the Declaration of Independence. Now later I'll be talking about Wounded Knee, which happened in 1890, right? And that's when the U.S. Army shot down old, uh, old people, women, and children. Merciless destruction of all ages. Uh, the Indians were defending their homeland and their families. From California to the New York Island, from the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters. Today we call this homeland security. But when Indians do that, we call that savage. And don't get me started on the Louisiana Purchase. When Napoleon sold Jefferson land, neither had ever been on, much less called home. None of the people who lived in all that land were for thousands of years called to their home or even consulted or even considered. Imagine waking up tomorrow, it's Friday, it's Veterans Day, and you read in the paper that Missouri has been sold by Mexico to Poland. <laughs> that is what Native Americans experienced from 1492 onward. People from other countries we've never heard of invaded our land and tried to eradicate us. And we are the first Americans and we are still here. There are 574 federally recognized tribes the Moshpee Wampanoag, and I mention them because they were there at the first Thanksgiving at Cape Cod, obviously lived differently from the Huma and the, and the values of Louisiana. And they lived differently from the Ute in the Rocky Mountains, who lived differently from the Pueblos in uh, New Mexico, or the Cherokees in the Great Smokies of Tennessee, which, by the way, Tennessee is a Cherokee word. There was a big village called Chonacy on the Tennessee River. And so both the state and the river take its name from this large Cherokee uh, village. All these tribes had distinct cultures, food, languages, dress, and appearances. And yet, when many people think of first Americans, it is of Plains Indians riding horses in an image frozen in time about 1870. Uh, in the popular imagination, we live in teepees and we have feather headdresses. Even though the majority of first Americans today do not live on reservations. In fact, the whole world about 2007, according to the UN, is not rural anymore. We, we, the majority of us live in the whole world in urban or suburban situations. But uh, certainly it's true of Native Americans. So each of these tribes' tales are unique, complex, and interesting. But they do share a common tragedy, and that is the taking of their land and the jacking of their identity. This is what happened to ensure justice would not creep in as to the reality of stealing. It's what I call the great identity theft. So when did Native Americans first become U.S. citizens? Was it with the ratification of the U.S. Constitution in 1789? Or could it be at the end of the Civil War in 1865? How about 1920, when women got the vote? The Cherokees became U.S. citizens along with all other American Indians in 1924, acquiring the right to vote in federal elections. That doesn't count state elections. They did not get the right to vote in Maine in state elections until the late 1970s. 
Hard to believe, isn't it, that the people who are here by the longest, the people that were Americans by birth and heritage, are denied the right to vote. There is a current fad right now. Uh, you may not see it now as we enter the winter, but I noticed it this summer, and it's going to be around a while. People wear t-shirts where they go places. You go to Aruba, or you go to New York City, or you go to Boston, and what it says the name of the town, and then it has EST, and then there's the date. And that, uh, you'll see that. I saw them quite a bit this past summer, and I think we're just at the edge of that. It'll be a fad for about four or five years, and it'll go away, and something else will take its place. What that means is established. I saw two which read California EST 1850 and Maine EST 1820, which means they were established. This is a clear statement that this area, area was established by white people at that time and completely negates the native people's experience of living in harmony in that locale for thousands of years. It is a prime example of current white erasure of native culture done in a very nifty and sneaky kind of a way. Because I'm thinking, wait a minute, people have been here for a long time. They may not have named it Maine, but they lived there. Um, so keep in mind, though, according to the Smithsonian Institute, Native Americans have served in all of our nation's wars from the Revolutionary War until the present at a higher percentage than any other ethnic group. Doesn't make complete sense to me, but it's true. Uh, and, and, and that was after, I mean, they got the right to vote last, but they're serving in the Civil War, Revolutionary War, Spanish-American War, uh, even World War I at a higher rate defending this country. The Osage, who were in Missouri, and in Oklahoma now, who fought bravely in World War II, in Italy, in the European theater, same place where, uh, uh, what, what was the senator from Kansas that was running for president, he had an injury, Bob Dole. He got his injury in, in Italy. So they were in foxholes, getting blown up, shot at, killed, wounded. When they when the war was over, they didn't get their GI Bill. They had to sue the government. It took four or five years. Meantime, everyone else is back, going to college, buying houses, starting family, building what they call legacy wealth. Because in this country, to get legacy wealth, you have to own property. For most of us, that means to buy a home. So while their comrades are getting on with their lives and getting more wealthy by owning a home, the Osage had to sit on the sidelines and had to fight their own government that they bled for in Italy to get the rights that were, should have been theirs to begin with. Um, it's hard to believe sometimes. It doesn't seem fair. In 1953, Congress passes a resolution beginning a policy of federal termination through which American Indians were to be disbanded in their land sold. And so this companion policy came along a relocation that moved Indians off the reservations to urban areas, one of which was St. Louis. And I had dinner just this past Friday with a Choctaw Zuni that lives in uh, St. Louis. And his mother, Choctaw, came up from Mississippi on that program in the 50s. And his father was a Zuni from Arizona and came up. And uh, he speaks neither one of the languages because he was in St. Anne, Missouri, and not living on his tribal land. In 1956, our late chief, the chief of the Cherokees, Wilma Mankiller, and her family moved to San Francisco from Oklahoma under this act. Much of the government aid never materialized. In other words, you left your home, you moved to the inner city, which seemed like a, a completely different experience, but the, the money for education and the money for homes quite often did not materialize. And so a lot of the Indians ended up unemployed, living in high rises. Um, another broken promise, more of the same. What about freedom of religion? Most of us think of that as a fundamental right. When did the first Americans, when did the Native Americans get this? 1978. It was taken away from us in the 1890s. It was restored in 1978. Um, if you did not know these things that I've just mentioned, you were not taught them. Much has been hidden. And then, of course, there are the boarding schools. They are a lot in the uh, news lately in Canada. 
It ended in the 1990s in this country. It ended in the 1970s. My Cherokee grandmother, Rachel Gritz, was afraid that her only child, Franklin, my father, would be stolen and forced to go to a boarding school. And so they lived on a little dirt road outside of a small town in northeastern Oklahoma. Cars were a rarity, so when they heard a car, he went and hid. Now when he turned eight, they found out about him living out there, and they approached her that he had to go to school. And so she made a deal that he would go to the local school in town, which he did. And I have his high school graduation picture, and there's 11 people in the graduating class. He's the big Indian in the middle because he's 21. Now that benefited him with athletics because he was a heck of an athlete, because he's a lot older and mature. Uh, he went on to OU and graduated and went on to Haskell Indian Nations University to become an art teacher, came to St. Louis and was art director for the Sporting News when they were here. And uh, most of you might remember the Sporting News, but before ESPN, Sporting News was where people got their sports information. Um, so, starting with the Wild West shows, and then Pulp Fiction books, and then winding its way through movies, and then TV, the identity of Native people were reduced, simplified, and twisted. We have we've been reduced on everyday objects, such as the image of the Indian head nickels. Uh, I remember seeing those as kids. I, fo I found one the other day in my pocket. Um, of course, they don't look like an Indian at all. It looks like a guy with a really big nose. And most of the Indians that I know don't have big noses. Uh, and even in cartoons, uh, Indians will show up as a silly kind of a stereotype. You can Google images of both Newt Greenbridge and Bill Clinton, both at around age five, sitting on little ponies with cowboy hats and Tory six shoes. That's what people did for the baby boomers. We were brought up on cowboy shows on TV, Hop Along Cassidy, Paladin, Ponderosa, Bonanza, I guess, was the name of the show, and you wanted to be a cowboy. So even though these two guys were on the opposite political thing when they were young, you can find pictures of them. So when I was young, I always wanted to be on the cowboy team because the Indians never won. <laughs> Ten litter Indians was that little rhyme that we used to sing, and it ends with, then there were none. A childhood ditty about genocide. Mm. To a larger degree, then, we were forgotten, especially in the Midwest, because we don't have any tribal governments here. Missouri, Illinois, Iowa, Indiana, Kentucky, Tennessee, Arkansas. There are no tribal governments in the middle of this country. Kansas has four small ones, reservations. Oklahoma has 39. Michigan, Wisconsin, New York, even Connecticut. They all have some kind of tribal government within their borders. The states that I mentioned do not, and because of that, there are fewer Indians here. So you have fewer contacts with them. If you go up to Minnesota and you walk into the campus of 3M, a huge company, you're going to meet somebody that knows an Indian that works in the IT department or the delivery department. But you don't get that so much here. We're not, we're not as, as visible because we're just not here. Um, so our image is still being held captive. I read last September uh, of 2021 an article in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch about Augusta, Missouri, where a developer is buying everything <laughs> and making everything look like it belongs out of the Napa Valley. Well, I got news for him, this is Missouri. We're not the Napa Valley. He's taking down a lot of trees. He's doing some things like that. Anyway, he's got a lot of statues scattered around town, and one of them is of a young Native American girl hugging the American flag in homage to Lewis and Clark. Uh, that is, it would be riotous to think of a Jewish girl embracing a Nazi flag and paying homage to Hitler and his career. Why would a young Indian gal be celebrating Bruce and Clark? In addition, he has a statue of an Indian sitting uh, outside a cigar store in town, a cigar store Indian. I mean, you can't really make this stuff up. This is today happening in this state. It's that thing of uh, stereotype uh, in really awful ways. So that is what I call the great identity theft, this wrong-headed idea about Native folks. Native American history is American history. Uh, 
if you are unaware of these things I'm sharing today, the question must be asked, why is that so? And that's why <coughs> land acknowledgement becomes so important. Even though it only takes a minute, it starts to reassert natives back into the American story. And Archimedes said, give me a place to stand and with a lever I will move the whole world. This is our lever, land acknowledgement. Regardless of your politics, government now seems frozen and large corporations will continue to make large profits. It's up to individuals and small groups of people to maintain a sense of balance, fairness, and to create hope. It's not going to come from up above. It's got to come from us and go up. I'm telling you folks, this house that we live in is on fire, and these things, balance, fairness, and hope, are the only way out. Drilling down being charity. I was born and reared in Missouri. As you can imagine, I've ne never met anyone in the entire state in my seven years who have my name, Galen Gritz. I seem to be the only one here. So it is with Native folk. I knew of no Native Americans until I was well out of college. I went to Mizzou for three years and then finished two years at UMSL. Um, so my isolation was designed by the dominant culture, hoping I would disappear further, and I almost did. Today in Missouri, I know Native people to be medical researchers, professors, engineers, teachers, social workers, artists, politicians, surveyors, flight attendants, retirees, housekeepers, and more. But as a group, we remain the poorest people in the country. And that's what happens when everything is taken away from you. Poverty is the spirit animal of the Native American folk. And even though over the years, I've met some Cherokees who live here, uh, it's not many. And yet the Cherokees are one of the most recognizable tribes in the country. Now in the first Harry Potter book, you may not be as familiar as perhaps your kids or grandkids, where did Harry Potter live in the first book? He lived under the stairs of his uncle and aunt's house. And did he know he was a wizard? He did not. And so what did his uncle and aunt teach him? Well, they didn't treat him very well. He was the redheaded stepkid. And I hope none of you are redheaded and get angry about that. Uh, I have a nephew that is. Uh, so was that right? Of course not. He had to learn about his wizard legacy uh, by doing so, he became more of a wizard as time went by. He worked his way into it, being who he was. And like Harry Potter, my journey in discovering my Cherokee heritage has been deliberate because so much of it, uh, the, of its destruction was deliberate. So I had to re, uh, regurgitate that, in essence, put it back together. And uh, of the nine states with the Trail of Tears crossed from the ancestral homes, Missouri has the most miles of this infamous trail, and I learned that from Bill Ambrose. And there were three routes which crossed the state. The northernmost route, Missouri, the one most traveled, came within an hour of St. Louis. So what's the story of the Cherokees? Well, we're from the southeast. We had early contact with the whites. We were quick to set up a government very similar to the United States government. Um, we developed a written language due to Sequoia, it was a miracle, it took him 10 years. He could not read any language, didn't speak English, but he saw what the Americans were using in the English, so he decided that the Cherokee should have one. He's the only person in history that made up a, a written version of his language. And it worked so well, by 1830, 90% of the Cherokees were literate. If you look at Missouri in 1830, or Georgia, I bet you 90% of the people were not literate. All you have to do is look at the William Hart Benton uh, uh, paintings around town and in museums, and a lot of times you'll see people lollygagging around with corn jokes. And uh, they work hard. Uh, there was no air conditioning, uh, but they didn't have time to learn how to read. Cherokees knew how to read. They were quick to learn and thought that they could gain the respect of the ever-increasing white population by embracing change. Well, they were wrong. There was a school started in Cornwall, Connecticut for Native students. They were very excited when two of the Cherokees, Eli uh, Boudinay and his cousin John Rich, who became very important later 
in Cherokee history when they arrived in Connecticut to attend this school from Georgia. However, the people in Connecticut were taken aback by their wealth and their sophistication. They had the newest carriage from London, would be like driving into town with a Lexus. They knew how to speak French. And uh, they were not children of the wilderness as they suspected they uh, might be, that they could lift them out of their backwards. And then when both of these Cherokee young men married daughters or prominent Cornwell uh, families, things really heated up. Racist mindsets of the earth could not tolerate the thought of respectable white women marrying a savage Indian, even though they were probably more sophisticated than most people in town. The two couples left Cornwall. They were more or less driven out, went to Cherokee country, and stayed married the rest of their lives. Pure love. New England wanted nothing to do with them. Early in the history of the U.S., the Cherokees found that their way of life was being uh, pressured. People wanted their land. It was continuous. Um, one of the reasons the Revolutionary War was fought, we always think of uh, unfair taxes, but a lot of it had to do with the fact that the British were keeping the Americans in the 13 colonies not having access to the Indian lands in Ohio, Indiana, Kentucky, where Boone came through the Cumberland Gap. And the first thing that happened after the war was fought by the United States and they had the Continental Congress, very first law that they passed, this is how important it was for them. They opened up all those lands. It was called the Northwest Territory in Indiana and Ohio. And they went in and took that land from the Indians. They fought wars because the Indians said, hey, wait, this is ours. Uh, and then Boone came down to the Cumberland Gap and to Kentucky and then on to Missouri. But, uh, that's pretty much why the war was fought, was to get Indian land. Um, mm -hmm. Then gold was discovered in 1829 in Dahlonega, Georgia, which is a small town in northeast Georgia. And to this day, if you go to Atlanta and see the state capitol, it's got gold guild on the dome, and that comes from Dahlonega. Uh, and when the gold was discovered, that gave Georgia the reason to tell, to pass a law that uh, a charity could not testify against a Georgian citizen. So now the Georgian ruffians were free to go in, uh, take Cherokee land, take their mules, rape their women, beat them up, murder them. Nothing you could do because a Cherokee who had been there forever could not now testify in a legal court. Now imagine that happening to you. And so there's pressure for them to sign and leave. Most of them did not want to, even under those circumstances. Of course, not all of them lived in Georgia. They lived in Alabama, they lived in Tennessee, uh, they lived in North Carolina, but that was pretty much strong pressure. Um, and then President Andrew Jackson, uh, based upon all that, signed the Removal Act, setting up the Trail of Tears. In Cherokee, Jackson is known as Jackson, which means Jackson the Devil. In fact, I had to laugh the other day because my 27-year-old son, uh, who's a, also a registered member of the tribe, I heard him use that. Uh, and there are, to this day, Cherokees will not touch a $20 bill. Most of them will, but some of the older ones won't. They say, you keep the 20, I'll take the 10, because the $20 bill has Andrew Jackson. Um, now, on the march to Oklahoma, which was known as the Great American Desert, at that time, one out of four of them died in a little over a year because of all kinds of different reasons. Not enough food going at night, not enough transportation. Uh, now just think if COVID had a death rate of that. COVID had a 0.2%, not even 1%. This is 25% of the nation died, and it was young and old primarily. It was our memory and our future. Even the flu of 1918 killed about 5%. It was much more devastating than COVID was. Uh, but it's still five times less than the, than the uh, Trail of Tears was in a year. Now, I don't mean to demean uh, anybody's death. And all deaths are to be mourned, COVID or flu or anything. So I only point this out that this was a deliberate thing that could have been stopped. It wasn't an unseen virus. It was a series of decisions made by individuals. That, uh, that decided to move the, uh, the native people. In fact, it was 
debated in Congress and it almost lost. But there was just enough people that wanted it that it happened. Um, so once they get to Oklahoma, which was known as the uh, Great American Desert at the time, uh, they start to rebuild their lives. They start the first female school that's free west of the Mississippi. They start their paper back up. 23 years later, civil war breaks out. A lot of the, just like Missouri, they did not succeed, they couldn't, they weren't a state, uh, but a lot of them favored the South, like a lot of people did in Missouri. We were a slaveholding state, but we did not succeed. They did not trust the federal government. Can you blame them? Since they just moved them 23 years before? Uh, so they favored the South. At the end of the war, some of their lands were taken from them as punishment. Now, one of the 13 states of the Confederacy lost land, even though they started the industrial bloodletting of both Union and Confederate soldiers. Uh, not one. And then the largest hanging was uh, during the war in 1862 in December in Minneapolis. The Dakota had, um, were fighting to protect their homelands, and they were defeated, and they wanted to hang 300 of them. But they hung 38 of them all at one time. And if you ever go to the airport and go downtown and you take a tram, you'll go right past the place where these 38 Dakota were hung. Um, and even though they were not trying to destroy the U.S., they were only trying to defend their families and their traditional land. Um, I guess it was okay for white people to attempt the overthrow of the U.S. government and kill thousands of their fellow citizens that if you were an Indian, you got hung. So after the war, Cyrus McCormick and John Deere discover steel plows, and now the great American desert becomes valuable. Iowa, Western Missouri, Kansas, Nebraska, the Dakotas. Before that, you couldn't plow with a wooden plow because the roots go down so deep, sometimes 12 feet, sometimes 36 feet. So the roots of the grass that go down, your plows is gonna break. And that's why they thought, we'll put the Indians out there because nobody wants that land. Think of the Sioux going to the Badlands. They were named that right until gold was discovered. But in any case, so now you have the great land rush in Oklahoma. Even though you just told the Indians they could be there forever. And so you have this gun go off and white people go in and take a certain amount of Indian land. Next what happens is oil. And uh, then you pass a law in Congress, you take the land from the tribes, you give it to individual Cherokee families or any Indian families, Osage, Choctaw. Most of them are not educated. A lot of them don't speak English. There's power in a group because the leaders were educated and were looking out for their people. Um, which sometimes they would do that today. But back then, that's the way things worked. And now you give it to individuals. It's a lot easier to take that land for oil. So that's how John Paul Getty is from Minnesota, goes down in Wildcats in Oklahoma off Indian land that he recently acquired. And he retires at 21 years old, becoming the richest man in the world off land that was recently the Indian land. So, as I mentioned earlier, the Osage Nation left the state of Missouri in the early 1800s. There were three treaties that they signed that they left. The first one was in 1808. And yet, the state legislature here in Jefferson City makes it illegal for Indians to be in this state in 1899. The minimum fine was uh, 300 bucks, and minimum, I'm sorry, the minimum fine was 30 days in jail and $250 if you were an Indian found to be in the state in 1899. And there was no maximum. Now that may seem like a long time ago, but all four of my grandparents were alive in 1899. And I remember how they treated my brother and sister and I. I remember what they liked to eat. I remember what they like to watch on TV. So when you look at it that way, it wasn't that long ago. And it would be illegal for me to be here talking to you if that law hadn't been rescinded at some point. So these things are not all just way back in the past, and you just can't make this up. The Cherokee Nation today is about 440,000 people uh, in 14 counties in Oklahoma. Most of us do not live there. About 60% of us are what we call at-large citizens. We live other places. Uh, there's a small band called the Ketua, and there are about 14,000 people, 13,000 of them live in Oklahoma. They are very traditional Cherokees. Um, 
And then in North Carolina, there are about 14,000 Cherokees on their own. Kuala Bandri, these are descendants of the Cherokees that managed to get away from the soldiers and hide out in the woods. And eventually they came out. My father, in speaking with North Carolina Cherokees years later, said it was very difficult because the verbiage was the same, the verbs, the syntax, nouns were different. Most things that had been invented, uh, they had separate words for them. airplanes, supermarkets, highways, radio, TV. They all used different nouns for those, uh, which you would because they'd been separated for over 100 years. So you had to really pay attention when you were listening to a North Carolina Cherokee if you were from Oklahoma. You could easily tell by the context, uh, you know, what they were talking about. Of course, the North Carolina Indians always thought that the Oklahoma Indians were traitors for leaving, and the Oklahoma Indians always thought the North Carolina Indians were hillbillies. So, you know, there's that, I guess. Um, but before the first trip of Columbus, half of the world, all the Western Hemisphere, were Native American, 100% of half the world. Today, according to the U.S. Census, it's 1.1%, both in Missouri and in the nation as a whole. That's quite a reduction. A lot of it had to do with diseases we didn't have, but rather than treating us nicely, they put us in prisons like reservations and they took our land. And a lot of it was, you know, wars, military operations. So this country was invaded and conquered. It was not settled. It was not a wilderness to be tamed. It had provided nearly for 14,000 years for the native people who had been here. We did not pollute God's creation by strip mining, fracking, damming rivers, building ash pits, or the like. Our food was locally sourced, non-GMO, and almost everything we used was biodegradable. Our fast food was fast. We had to chase it. And then we got it. When the French showed up in St. Louis to found the city of St. Louis, the average height was 411. The Osage was 63 to 66. That's good health. That's good eating. We're in terrible health now because of the reservation food and, and the depression. We have a lot of overweightness, obesity, and diabetes. So uh, things need to, to change when it comes to that. Now, the, the evidence of the invasion is all around us. Think of this, Fort Worth, Texas, Fort Smith, Arkansas, Fort Gibson, Oklahoma, Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, Fort Wayne, Indiana, and so on. Both Detroit and Pittsburgh were founded as forts. They go by different names now. And these are offensive force of invasion, not defensive. They're, it wasn't that the Americans were here being attacked by the Indians and being forced into the Atlantic. It was the other way around. So even around us, you can see the artifacts of this invasion. Presidents who fought in these special military operations against Indians were George Washington, Prince and Indian War, Andrew Jackson, Creek and First Seminole War, War, William Henry Harrison, Northwest Indian War, James Polk, he was a colonel in the Tennessee State Militia. He saw no action, but that Tennessee Militia was founded to fight the Shawnees. Uh, Zachary Taylor, Black Hawk War and Second Seminole War, and Abraham Lincoln, the Black Hawk. So by after that, pretty much there were a lot more uh, Americans and the wars became kind of an afterthought. Uh, the natives also had a disadvantage as they were always defending non-combatants, the elder, the women, and their children. That put you at a disadvantage. Now, as I mentioned before, Wounded Knee happened uh, in 1890 in uh, South Dakota. 300 Native Americans were slaughtered, mainly women, children and old men. It was a cold winter, even for South Dakota. They were guilty of no crime and were not engaged in combat. But they were slaughtered. Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone, got his patent in 1876. I want to give you an idea of what the world was like in 1890. The Eads Bridge in St. Louis was completed in 1874. North Dakota State University is founded in Fargo in 1890. In 1882, uh, Rockefeller had so much money, he had to put Standard Oil into a trust. 1886, Statue of Liberty is dedicated. Brooklyn Bridge was completed in 1883. Idaho and Wyoming became states in 1890. The Vertical Loop roller coaster is patented in 1898. 
nine, eight years later. But that's because in 1878, 60, 1878, okay? So we're 12 years before Wounded Knee. 60,000 people are coming to Coney Island every weekend during the summer. Yosemite becomes a national park in 1890. That census of 1890 was the first time it was tabulated by a machine. That company that did that eventually became IBM. And it found that there were 63 million Americans. There were 250,000 Indians on the lower 48. 63 million, 250. At that time, there was so much wealth that you have wealth to recreate at Coney Island and Yosemite. And yet you have leisure time. 60,000 you can go to Coney Island every weekend. But there's still time to kill 300 Indians on the plains of South Dakota. So much for the Indian Wars. Not really, it's not so much fair fights. So, this goes back to Christopher Columbus, who made a big mistake. He was 9,000 miles off, thought he was in India, and he was here. And of course, uh, that's the beginning of it all. That's why American Indians love to say, party like it's 1490. So the many lies about them are so numerous that amounts to identity theft. Now we have some states that have gag rule, rule, rules uh, trying to prevent what they call divisive concepts in public schools, including race, gender, and dark moments in American history. This is a new attack on Native Americans and their story. Uh, I was in Oklahoma City in September. And it was the first time I had the opportunity to visit the McMurray building where Timothy McVeigh, a far-right radical, murdered 168 people, including 19 children. It was a profoundly moving experience for me and everybody in that museum, as it is every single day of the year that it's open. But I couldn't help but think, under Oklahoma's current gag law, you could argue that it should be closed because it made me feel uncomfortable and sad. So we don't need to be doing that. We need to get rid of that law. We don't need to be closing down chapters of our histories. Uh, we all make mistakes. We all have done wrong. Thank goodness there's forgiveness. Um, we need to know the truth and the truth will set us free. We need to be able to see each other clearly as human beings for us to relate to each other. And the time of exploitation is over. We're no longer a wealthy country because of the amount of oil or the amount of tons of steel that we make or how many, much corn acres we have. It's human beings, it's human resources. It's all about electronics and connectivity and algorithms. So we need to realize the most important resources we have are each other. And so from within our better natures, we must build bridges of understanding and with each breath that we take, we have a new chance. The future of the first Americans depends on the same thing that all of us need to, to, to thrive, and that's civil behavior, good manners, kindness, knowledge, and acceptance. If your present or future seems wrapped in fear, you need to get a new paradigm because this is not how we have been called to live or to share life. This has been a lot of information. It is just a part of the Cherokee story. I tell it because I am a member of the Wolf Clan. We are protectors. Wado, thanks.